Okay, we are a couple of minutes over, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, sorry that we started uh, a little bit later on our intro video. I apologize for that, but we still have people that are coming in, so that's awesome. So we will go ahead and get started. So welcome to the Platform Analytics Academy for October 4th. I'm glad that you're here. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're returning, uh, welcome as well. Hopefully you all will get something out of this. Uh, let me make sure that I can move forward here. There we go. So uh, as usual, go through some housekeeping things and then we'll get directly to our content. But this is for you. We try as hard as we can to bring fresh ideas, better understanding and practical guidance to uh, platform analytics, reporting, performance analytics, the platform in general, as much as we possibly can. And today we're going to try to do that as well. This is being recorded. It will be out on the community later on this afternoon or early tomorrow morning uh, as well. We'll be out on our YouTube page our YouTube channel as well. So look for that there. Um, also, this I, I will take this slide deck and convert it to a PDF and I'll attach that to the community event as well. So if this is information that that you need and you want to share within your organization, you're definitely more than welcome to do that as well. Please ask questions. If you could definitely utilize the Q&A, um, that way we can actually get those questions and um, from Zoom after the call and uh, we'll have those on record and we, we we try to take those questions and look through those as much as we can to to think about different things, different sessions and future things as well for uh, ServiceNow as well. And also I have panelists that are here with me that will try to answer those questions uh, as they come in, if they can via type. If they can and it needs to be live, we'll definitely take those questions. So we're covering a pretty broad spectrum of, of information today. So the questions kind of may be all over the place and that's okay. But if it is a question that is unrelated to the content that we're covering today, then we'll try to get to those um, at the end. Unless, like I said, one of the panelists that are here with me can uh, take care of that question via type or something like that. But please feel free to ask questions and it looks like they're already coming in, which is awesome. Uh, but if you could uh, try not to put those in the chat and put them in the Q&A, we'll definitely uh, appreciate that. So Safe Harbor, um, try to always make sure that we put this here. I don't necessarily know that there's any content today that um, falls into this, but I think that there could be some conversations and uh, different information that, that may even be shared by the panelists that could fall underneath this. So we just want to make sure that we share it and um, have you keep it in mind. So my name is Thomas Davis, and I am the host and presenter today. And I know that I have, I uh, let me check, is everybody here? Everybody is here. So Dan Kane is here, Adam Stout is here, Tara Fisher is here. And we also have RJ, uh, who is on our inbound side, that is, uh, he's kind of in transit. So he may be difficult for him to answer some questions, uh, but he'll try if he can, but he's here anyway. But all of these panelists are here to answer questions and make this content uh, better for you. So... With that, let's go ahead and get into what we're going to be talking about today. So today we wanted to talk about, um, like I said, a, a few different things, but it's really around mastering data relationships and all the possibilities that are available within or some of the possibilities that are, are inside of the platform that gives you that ability to do that. Some of these things you may be familiar with, uh, some of them you may not. Uh, some of them you may find elementary and some of them you may not. But these are, uh, in our mind, really good things that we wanted to make sure that we get on video and talk about that way um, if someone needs that, obviously, later on down the road, or if there's something that you want to pass through to your organization that you would have a source to do that with. So today we're going to talk, like I said, about dot walking, related list conditions, remote tables, and, and some database views uh, stuff as well. So with that, let's go ahead and get into it. So obviously, the agenda, dot walking, related list conditions, remote data. Uh, well, actually, that should be uh, remote tables and then database views. So the first thing that we want to talk about is dot walking. So dot walking is something that is probably one of those things I know for me when I first got into the platform as a former customer is one of those things that I earned. I learned very, very early is the idea of being able to get to uh, information that is referenced from somewhere else and how to actually be able to do that. So um, it's one of those things that gives you the ability to traverse different tables and all of those things and actually pull that information together to not only view it, but to also maybe even set some filters on it, uh, some set some some filters in um, different places like an indicator source or a breakdown source or inside uh, as you're building a report. There's a lot of different places directly on tables and all those different things that you can actually do with with dot, uh, dot walking. So 
let's talk about um, notation and what notation means. And that's basically where you'll actually, the idea of a dot, which is just basically in between two different uh, points of information that again are referenced somewhere and they can actually talk to one of those. But let's talk about the different ways that you can actually do that. So the first is table hierarchy. So the data is organized, obviously, into tables. And they're, and these tables often have relationships with one another. So, for example, you might have incident table that is related to a user table through a reference field such as the assigned to. So that is where that reference comes into. So having the ability to talk, have tables talk and, and, and use that information inside of reporting and other needs is, is very powerful. So at accessing related data. So this is the ability to use dot walking notation and it involves chaining together table and field names with periods, dots, like I said, to indicate the path of the desired data that you have. So for, for instance, incident dot assigned to dot name is that notation starts with incident table, follows the relationship to the user, and then through that to the assigned to reference field and retrieves the name from a name field from the related list user. So again, tying that information and being able to pull some information back that you want. So dot levels, right? Dot levels can be multiple levels deep. You can chain together several dots to traverse through multiple related tables. Uh, and an, an example of that is incident, maybe incident to department, to manager, to email. So here you have an incident and you want to get the department and then the manager email. You can actually traverse all of that to get to the manager record to find out what their email is and then also the user or the department that they're in. So again, you know, the levels uh, can go many levels deep. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's always a great idea, but you can definitely go multiple levels when you're actually looking for this information. So next is filtering and query. And I talked about this a little bit earlier. So you can use dot walking and queries and filters to specify the conditions based on related data. So for an example, if you wanted you know, incident dot assigned to dot department and you want it to equal HR, then you could look at incidents where the assigned to's department is HR. So it gives you the ability to filter down that data. And, and that's a really good thing because maybe you have a thousand records or a thousand incidents and you want to actually, you know, break that down and say, I don't want to look at a thousand at one time. Well, maybe doing something like that obviously would trim that information down uh, quite a bit. So Filtering and querying is definitely something that you can take advantage of dot walking in that. So aggregate functions. This is another way that dot walking can also be used to aggregate functions like count and sum and average, et cetera, to perform calculations on related, da uh, related data. So I saw that a question came in and it is how deep can dot levels be? Now, I've not found a number. So Adam, uh, Dan, or Tara, or even RJ, I've not found a number, but I think that it's, uh, you it need to be careful with it. That's what I'll say, right? You so, need to be careful with how many you do, because you got to think about that's processing on the system of how far you're going to go down. And it could, you know, yeah, you was going to say but, something, Adam? Yeah, I mean, it depends is, is the real answer. Um, I, the old, rule, the old uh, rule of thumb was three, but we certainly go beyond three. Um, but understand when you're dot walking, what it's doing is joining the tables in the background. Now, uh, this is it's optimized for dot walking. So by default, every reference field, you can only dot walk on reference fields and every reference fields indexed in the database. So we, we are doing indexes, but we're joining. So if you're doing three, fine, it should be fine. If it's, you're doing four, probably okay too. But when you start um, querying or uh, uh, putting your where condition on that, well, now it's got to do the join and do the filter. If you're just referencing it, it's it's how fast the database can optimize it. But understand it is joining it. And if you're in a situation where you have really large tables and you're dot walking four, five, six, seven levels, um, what you might want to do is start looking at, at some flows or how do you st structure the data so that that data gets copied down so that you can shortcut some of those. Or we might use a database view, which we'll get to later, about shortcutting that. But you definitely want to start with just simple dot walking and then tune if needed. Don't over engineer or, or, or avoid it um, unless you run into a performance problem. And most of the time we're not going to. And if we have a thousand records or 10,000 records that are coming back, it's fine. Like if I'm looking at ac active incidents and I need to dot walk to the callers department's manager, I, I'm fine. Just do that. Um but do understand in the background what is happening is it's just going to basically dynamically create those joins for us on the fly. Um, and they're all, uh, 
inner well the left left joints to come through i believe unless somebody's going to correct me um but that's what's happening in the background it depends um to go through don't be scared of it but when you when in all the uis if you're dot walking five six seven ten levels i just want to understand my data model as to why i'm doing that um and it becomes it starts to be hard to it starts to be hard to read uh and understand in all the uis when you have that much dot walking so let's see if we can grab these two questions here real quick. So are there limits to the amount of fields available in dot walking and or is there a limit to the types of fields that can be dot walked, like created by, for an example? So it really comes down to whether or not there's a reference somewhere else for a particular field on what you can actually dot walk to. So so created by is a special one. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that uh, that got asked by uh, Mr. Anonymous or Miss Anonymous. Um so created by is a string because it comes, it's a string because in theory you could delete a user or a record could come from some, could come from someplace else. So it's a string of the username, even if that user doesn't exist. Uh, when we talk about data, maybe we'll come back to database views. There's ways that we can, we can join to this user. We can, we can force it effectively uh, to come through. And there's other places we do this in, in reporting, um, I think the sys report table does this where we used to only have created by, but we wanted to know some more attributes, like what department did, did the creator come from? And what we would do is we would add a field to the table that was um, creator or something like that. You, we wouldn't call it specifically created by, but it'd be something very derivative of that. And then put a, a, uh, a flow on it or, or a business rule that would say, Hey, whenever created by gets updated or updated by gets updated, set this field which is a reference the the limit is it must be a reference as thomas said created by is a string which would be nice if it was a reference but there's some reasons why it's not and it's not it's not going to change but you can you can make it right you can make what would have been a, or keep the string but add a new field that's a reference and then you get all the benefits for now the the, the next question is uh around efficiency so you know, uh, which which direction should someone go? Should it be incident to assignment group or user table to incident record and to determine the fastest route uh, to the user's email? So um, I guess I guess what I what I would say, and please, if I say it wrong, I would I would. My question is, where are you starting from? So if you're looking at incident records and you're trying to provide some sort of reporting on incident records, that's obviously where you're starting. I don't know that I would, I guess you could, I don't know that I would start at the sys user report to then generate incidents. I mean, I guess you could do that direction, but I think it comes down to which direction that you're coming from. I don't know that there, is there any efficiency that you're aware of, Adam, depending on which direction that you it, want to go? It's logic. You, you always have to yeah. start at the lowest level. Um, so if I want the incident assignment, uh, assign, incident assign group. assignment group to the user. Yeah, table. well, the and the other issue is you can't go um, you you can only you can only dot, dot lock is forward is from the lowest going up, so the incidents, uh, you can get the incident, you can get the group, but you couldn't get the list of the members in the group that wrote the incident. Uh, th that's when we come at the database views, which we'll talk about when we have M to M's. Um, if we do an, a single M to M, we actually start on the M to M table. It gets a little weird. If I wanted to do incidents to problems. And I have an M to M. I know uh, by default we do um, incidents have problems. The problem field isn't a record on incident, but you can also do it where um, uh, you can create an M to M where many problems can have many incidents and many incidents can have many problems. If I were reporting on that, I'd actually start on that M to M table and dot walk up both sides. Um, but there is, it, it's all logic bound, not efficiency. Um, we'll do as much as we can in the efficiency um, to come through. There are cases where I'm just doing too much and I need to, I do need to create a shortcut or I need to do something with the database view. It's very rare. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I might have done it, but it, I, I've been working with service now for 10 years and it's, I can't think of when I actually did do something like that. Just dot walk. Um, that's the, I think the most important thing we get from this is you just dot walk and get it to work. If it's too slow, then we'll talk about it. But generally the vast majority of the time it's going to be performance will be fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of keep going forward. So I don't, maybe some panelists can answer that question, those other questions via type, but if not, we'll get to those um, here shortly. So, 
Uh, the next thing I want to do is, and I don't necessarily have to read all these, but these are some just some general use cases that uh, that I was able to come up with with maybe when you'll actually, you know, some ideas of when you can use some uh, some dot walking. So, um, and I'll just go over a couple of these. I'll make sure that all of these are listed out in the uh, the PDF that I'll attach to the community later. So, and this is in the incident management process, you can dot walk. Can, you can you can use dot walk display information about the assigned user, their department, contact details on the incident form, for example, incident dot assigned to dot name, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and then maybe on change management, you uh, when working with change management, dot walking can help you show the details of the change requester, including their contact information. So again, it's very similar. It's about you know when you're you're at the incident or the change or asset problem, wherever any of those things that has an assigned to user or something of that uh, relation there, you can definitely uh, get to and dot walk to all that different information. So again, I won't necessarily go through all of these, but there, there's some different ideas of when you can use. Um, dot walking and we'll have uh the next slide actually show some demo of different things but i'll make sure that these are all listed out of different things for you to think about these may be things that you're already doing uh things that you definitely have thought about but there are some different things that you can do um in in a wide variety of the platform not necessarily incident i know quite often on these calls we we do talk about incident uh, a lot but dot walking can obviously be used in multiple places within the uh the platform itself so uh, like I said, a couple different ideas of some different things, and and uh, you can look at those later in that PDF. So, so in this, so our use case is you need to show the assigned to manager and their email for instance that are in a progress state or in are in progress as their state. So here, anywhere that you see those pluses in any one of that information, that kind of lets you know that there is uh, not kind of, but actually lets you know you have the ability to sort of dot walk, and you can see there that actually the assigned to dot manager, there's already a dot walk that we did. And we were able to move that over to the report. And then I grabbed the email and you can see here I've, how, how I've highlighted it, that those two now, because of dot walking, has given me the ability to add that information to uh, a report. And obviously I already set the state as in progress. And when I run that, then now I'll actually get some incidents back that have the assigned to and the manager in their particular email. This is something that's very, uh, probably very elementary. A lot of people have done this. But this is what dot walking is and what it uh, looks like. So the next example is, uh, can you create a report that shows all incidents where the assigned to manager is Fred Luddy? So here we're going to do that directly uh, within the condition. So we're going to look at assigned to and then we're going to look um, where manager and then we're going to actually put manager is and select Fred Luddy. So here we have the dot walk and we'll put his name in and basically you've just filtered down the results that you have again going from maybe 10,000 records to a couple whatever you have so again dot walking directly right inside of uh the filter and the way that we can verify this is we can just basically go there grab the same manager drag that over and display it and then we'll know that our filter condition that we put in via dot walking is true because now we can see it inside of our results so again dot walking very similar not only can you do it in the report, you can do it in the filter uh, as well. And this uh, gives us the ability to show some dot walking at the table level. So if you have a table and you go down to show related fields at the table level of any, whatever table that you're at, you can see here now with uh, that arrow that's beside it that you can go deeper into um, information basically that's referenced inside of this and you have the ability to filter that information and then you can filter the incidents down directly there so again we've went to assign to's manager is fred luddy and we've ran that and now all the only incidents that we'll get back is where the assigned to manager uh equals fred luddy so there there was uh some examples of how you can do that at the table level. You can do it uh, in the filter of a report and you can do that um, directly, uh, directly in the report as well and the results that you have. Listen, this is not all the places that you can do this. There's many places that you can do uh, this. That you can uh, absolutely do it in uh, performance analytics at an indicator source. If you want to filter information down there, you can definitely do it there as well. You can do it in scripting. So here you can see if you chose to do uh, a script and you needed a dot walk into it, you can see here right there. So open by dot manager is letting you know who it was open by and their manager. A couple of different places here where dot walking has just been hard coded into it because it knows the notation the platform does and the scripting does that it knows that if you have uh, incident dot caller ID, you know what you're looking for or incident, you know, the, to display that. 
a uh, couple different places again that you can do that directly inside of scripting as well. So dot walking, although um, maybe very uh, elementary, as in just the maturity of the platform itself, is very powerful in the places that you can actually um, use that. So uh, I, I would definitely talk about some best practices when you're coming to this, which is kind of like some things that we talked about a little bit ago with the the questions, but make sure that you understand the, the level, right? Avoid excessive dot walking levels. Uh, each dot does represent a relationship between tables and going too deep can impact performance. Make sure that you strive to keep dot walking to a minimum, ideally no more than three, as Adam said, three or four levels deep. Um, if your, your query requires more depth, consider alternate met methods like glide record queries or, and as Adam was talking about, database views and things of that sort. So um, pay attention to the level of your dot levels that you have. Uh, indexing, Adam did talk about that as well. So ensure the fields that, that are frequently accessed uh, through dot walking are indexed. Indexing fields allow for faster retrieval and ServiceNow often provides default indexes that are commonly used for fields. So probably a lot of what you're dot walking, hopefully it's probably already been indexed, but make sure that you, if you're not an admin, talk to one of your admins to look and see if, especially if it's a field that you're commonly using with dot walking. Um, scope applications. So if you're working with scope applications or custom tables, do be aware of table hierarchy and relationships specific to that application. Understanding the relationships will definitely help you when you use dot walking uh, to make sure it's more efficient and avoid unnecessary complexity. Um, so understand when you're in scoped apps. Data security. So always consider, you know, when using consider security when you're using dot walking. Um, ensure the users have appropriate permissions to access tables and fields involved in dot walking. Uh, this is critical to maintain data confidentiality and uh, integrity. So know, you know, if there are certain fields, obviously that the security needs to be on. Make sure that you're doing that definitely. And then performance testing. So. Before implementing a dot walk um, into production environment, maybe you want to take a look at it and, and put it through some, you know, thorough performance testing, accessing the impact of dot walking queries on system performance, and especially in scenarios where a large volume of records are involved, um, adjust your design if necessary to optimize the performance. And I think, again, that goes back to what Adam was saying. You know, if you have multiple levels of dot levels, obviously more than three or four, Find out what the efficiency of that and what the performance is of that, because everybody, almost everybody has an attention that span is that's pretty low. So waiting for a report to, to load when there's, you know, it comes down to too many levels of dot walking, people are definitely going to let you know. So make sure that you're aware of that. So, you know, and, and following, you know, best practices definitely will give you the ability to harness the power of dot walking in service now. And again, while maintaining, you know, system performance and data security and streamline user experience. So before I go to related list conditions or any that we need to answer out loud. All right. So next, I want to talk about related list conditions. Uh, again, another very powerful feature and um, being able to add another level of conditions to uh, a report or to a breakdown source or to an indicator source is uh, very powerful. And I want to make sure that we talk about that. And they can be particularly valuable in scenarios where you want to focus on relevant data and provide users a more tailored view of information. So with that, so let's talk about some quick benefits of use, utilizing related list conditions. So precision and relevance in reporting. So related list conditions allow you to construct reports with high accuracy and concentration on relevant data. Uh, it ensures the reports are more meaningful and pertinent to the intended audience, uh, which in turn facilitates better decision making. So, again, being able to take a report or something of that nature that maybe has a high volume of results and using related list conditions to trim that down even more. Not only are people going to be happy about it, but it's just it's just a better idea when it comes to actually what you're presenting to the audience. So anytime that you can use a related uh, list condition to bring down the amount of results and make the report even better in that concept, definitely make sure that you take advantage of that. So enhanced report performance. So optimizing data processing, right? So by concentrating on the necessary data in related lists, the system can generate reports faster and reduce the burden of resources and enable quicker access to information and enhance the user satisfaction, which I kind of talked about a little bit before. Um, increase user adoption and productivity. So 
More concentrated and relevant information produces reports that are easier to comprehend, increasing user adoption and encouraging more informed decision-making process. This helps the focus also allows users to spend less time on creating and modifying and interpreting reports and leading to higher productivity. So if you create something that gives them that ability right from the beginning, there's no editing that they have to do or anything like that because it is definitely giving them what they need. Customization and flexibility. So conditions uh, allow the crafting of customized reports to cater to specific organizations or organizational or department needs. Uh, they provide dynamic reporting capabilities that can easily be modified to adapt to varying requirements. And this is without extensive alterations to the report configuration because you're doing it directly inside of the report, inside of that related list condition. And then better compliance and, sec and security. So controlling related list conditions in reports um, and, and base that on predetermined conditions, again, ensures the protection of sensitive data and allows access only to authorized users, which in turn, you know, helps in maintaining compliance within your organization and anything that you have of that nature. So I think there's great, incredibly great benefits to it. It's just putting your mindset into some of these things. These aren't all the benefits, but these are the ones I came up with just to give you an idea of what you can do with related list conditions if you, you decide to utilize those. So again, here are a couple different ways that you could um, use, you know, related list conditions. So in this case, for an organization managing a large number of incidents, creating a report that shows incidents related to business applications. Um, show business applications with associated incident that is critical in priority. Now, I will say also that we have gotten a lot better with the data that is definitely accessible directly at the table level. And I think the, the more related list conditions that are created and that information is passed on to our development team, they do add those into it. And what I'm talking about, so if you're looking at um, an incident report, now I believe that you can get the business application directly inside of that um, report. It'll actually bring those uh, back. If you add that, when you configure the rows, you can add and you can bring that back. You can actually filter directly on that, just some different ways. And again, the more that we do of these, um, the developers find out and they add more of these direct relational things directly into it. So Again, these are a, a few different ways that you can use it. Again, I'll make sure that I list these out for your con consideration inside of the PDF when we get there. Um, but again, related list conditions are, are very powerful in what they can do. So let's show a couple of uh, demos of what we can do. So here's an example of change management reporting. So a report is needed to show any change requests that have not been assigned any task, any change task. So here we're just gonna create the report and we're gonna to point to the change request table. And I'm doing that here. And then when we get there, then on my filter, I'm just going to, I'm gonna go ahead and say uh, active is true. And then in my related list conditions, I'm gonna look for uh, the change tasks uh, or the change request task. There it is. So change task request. And I'm gonna say that's true as well. So basically I wanna see where it is. There are no change tasks that have been signed to a change request. And here we can see that we have quite a few of those that uh, have not been assigned. No tasks have been actually assigned to the change. And the way that we can verify that is we can go directly into that. And under the related links, we can look that there's been no change tasks that have been assigned to that. So again, perhaps very elementary for some of the people that are on this call, but if you're looking for a way to find out when any change requests don't have any change tasks, related list condition gives you that ability. So let's see what else we have here. So this yeah, use case is that. when generating reports about configuration items only show CIs with two or more incidents created in the last 60 days. So a lot of CIs, most organizations have a lot of CIs. So here we want to find out, OK, of those CIs and for incidents that have been created in the last 60 days, how many of those CIs have two or more current incidents that are actually created for that? So here you can see that there's 3,925 different um, CIs there. So now let's actually connect that directly to the uh, incident. And we can do that. And here I want to see where created on the last 60 days. And I can select that there. And then I can also say that has greater than two 
greater than or equal to two incidents. And then when I click run, you'll see that we'll go from 3,925 to now that those, those CIs there are where, let me go back, just pause that. So now we went from 3,900, however many it was, and we we're able to filter that information down to seven. So seven CIs in the last 60 days have had two incidents or more uh, associated with them. So again, a way of trimming information down for the users to um, take it in and actually do something with it. So another great use case that you can do there. So uh, before let me get to the best practices or anything that we need to answer aloud. Yeah, there's a few in here that I think we need to talk about. Okay. I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure I understand the question that clearly. So I thought maybe we could just talk about it. Sure. Um, Which one are you talking about? Um, I was looking at Agata's. Uh, I have a use case list of um, uh, rhythms without SC tasks or all SC tasks are closed with no approval pending. How would you approach that? It looks like, I don't know if Jane, you were trying to answer that or... Um, I don't know if you want to come because I'm not sure. It, I, well, ahead. so the, so for that one, uh, the or so the way that you have to do it with the related list conditions is that you're going to flip it. Um, ors are going to be a problem. Um, uh, important note with the related list conditions is that they're always anded. They're always anded, so you may have to do two reports to come through things, which is not the end of the world. Um, but for this one, if I were going to do without SC tasks. Um, or all of them are, or all of them are closed. What you're looking for, if I get this right, is that there are no open tasks, right? Mm -hmm. So they're all closed or they don't exist. So you want zero open tasks. It, 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 I'm going to rephrase that, but I think we get the same answer. So we would be saying, give me all my, um, uh, yeah, all my rhythms. My report would be on rhythm. My related list condition would be on SC task, um, which references rhythm, and then I go where there are no zero open tasks, and I think I get the right answer. And then no pending approvals. Um, I'm not familiar where the approval is going to be. Um, if the approval is on the rhythm, that would be fine because uh, this pet approval should be hopefully it would be a state on there. Um, the other thing that you might have to do with related list conditions, and I I love related list conditions, they're super powerful, um, but there are still cases where I'll use a dynamic, a dynamic filter condition, particularly if I need to use multiple. You can only use one related list condition at a time um, and uh, a way to get around that is to write, is to use dynamic filter conditions, um, which I don't know if we're going to talk about now, but I know we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. Um, so that's that's how you do it. But the the trick with related list conditions is think about what do you don't want. Like I'm looking for something that doesn't have this, then y'all use none. Um, it, it 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 just takes a little bit to think about it. But if I want something that doesn't have this, then you're looking for none of the other thing. Um, I'll go through a couple of these other ones that I see. Is there a way to yeah. add? Uh, so hopefully someone answered that one. Um, if there's a way to add other tables to a related list condition, yes, the base tables have to reference the table you're reporting on. Um, it is not something that's done on the fly. It's like dot walking. Dot walking is all pre-configured because I say this is a reference to this table so I can dot walk with a related list condition. Sorry, I don't know if we actually said it because I was typing in a different, I was typing an answer in this. When we, this first came out, I tried, I tried. The nickname I was going for was moonwalking. You got dot walking and moonwalking where you're going backwards, but they still rely on having a reference. Um, and so for it, if it's not showing up, it's because the, the table you're going for doesn't directly reference the parent table. Um, and so if it's uh, the, the heartburn I get from this sometimes is where it's two dot walks away and then we don't get it or it had to go through an M to M or I had some database view. So related list conditions are, are, are a lot like dot walking to go. If you can use it, use it. It's way easier. It's very configurable, but it, it handles lots of use cases, but it does not handle every use case. And so that's when we'll still use the different techniques that we'll go through today. Okay, thank you, Adam. I don't know if anyone wanted to, if we wanted to talk through the, uh, the question about the uh, classic view of reporting that from Holly, one at the top. 
I am so, taking a look at that to see. Cause okay. That's, okay. Cause I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I was going to see if we, um, as a group, it, we might have that. It needs to work. Um, we need to be able yeah. to put, put those in. So I, I'm actually taking a look at that. Um, okay. At, and I'll try and answer that one uh, a little bit later on if we want to um, move forward. Oh, hey, another one came in, and I, I, I love this question about um, cis relationships. This only handles um, this only handles references, direct references. It does not handle uh, relationships. Um, relationships are awesome uh, for related lists, but reporting does not you does not use those today. Um, safe harbor. I keep asking for it. I'd love to be able to do it. Um, you can get the equivalent of that if you use a dynamic filter option. So if I take my logic and I put in a script include, um, it's not exactly the same, but logically you can get it to work um, very similarly by doing um, by doing a dynamic filter option. So if you're if you're in there writing a script, just write two, one to use in my report and then one to use my related list condition or my, my related list. And Adam, you, you answered this one. I don't know if it was to this one, but you can only have one Related list condition, no, you can't have multiple. So you you had said that, right? So you guys that have, yes, that's correct. You yeah. can't have, you can't have two sets that go to the same table. Um, you can use ors inside of it, and your related list condition, the the condition at the bottom can have you know big ors that's coming from the table, um, but only one at a time right. um, within the same table reference, right? Yeah, within the same table reference. Yes, that is right. And, so, and well, I was gonna say the comment though, if you're using CIs then you might want to look at CM, CMDB Query Builder because you have a tremendous amount of flexibility with what you do. Yeah, query builder. yeah and there is a uh, there is a couple sessions that we did. Uh, if you check our previous sessions, I believe that there was one last year and uh, one a couple years ago or earlier than that, but it actually shows uh, the CMDB Query Builder and, and just like Adam said, showing some pretty fancy stuff there. So if you've not checked that out, you definitely want to check that out for CI information. So... I'm also wanting to know for that specific question on I need the, you know, for CIs that do not have a parent and the related list, the parent isn't, shouldn't have to be a related list. So in that case, you should only, you should be able to apply the filter at the core table and then the related list condition just, I believe it was into that. I don't remember what your, what your second level table was. So in that, that once there, but in general, what they're saying about yeah, this not being able to apply it to two two different tables within the same within the same query. Okay, great. Thank you, Dan. And wait, and let's grab that last one from Art. I'm going to put Adam on the spot because I remember this, and I can't remember the answer. When you add columns to a list view, some of them are read and appear to be automatic dot walks. What are these, and how would I add one? I I totally remember when I used to do reporting, running into those, but I can't remember what they were. So I would call them brown, but red. <laughs> I think I think we're talking about the same. They were thing. red. They used um, to be red. Okay. Well, my color perception is not great. Um, <laughs> so the uh, uh, so this is if I'm um, not personalizing, but I'm configuring a list view, particularly in classic view, um, and and I'm changing the list view, and I, I or I, I'm sorry, you'll see it in some reports. Um, we have the green. All the fields that are on the table are black. You'll see ones that are green. Sometimes that little plus sign where I'm able to expand the dot walk. The ones at the bottom are red, um, uh, brownish red, um, red. And what those are are ref related uh, extended fields. So you'll see them if you could click on task. If you do a report on task, you are going to see you'll see more red fields than you will black fields. Um, if you go to uh, like plan task you'll see uh, the some of the ones that come from that as well. So they're allowing you to access referenced fields. Um, and actually there was another comment. You can do it in script as well with the reference underscore from the base table. It's a little odd. There's use cases for this um, where you need extended fields. So if I was reporting on, on task, I can get the uh, number is on task and I can see incidents and changes together. A report on task and say where the class is change or incident. It'll show me changes and incidents together. The number field is the same. So I just need number. But if I wanted caller, if it's an incident, I want to see the caller in the list view and I'm reporting on task. And I also want to see changes. I'd report on task and underneath the, on the bottom, there'll be incident would be in red and it would give me the caller field, um, which is only on incident. It's going to be null for changes. So that's, yeah, it's the extended fields. Front when you're on the 
the base table, you have access to the extended fields. Now, I will say, I believe not everybody has access to that. And I really don't recall whether that Z-Boot's on. I think it does. Um, it's a system property, whether or not you show that um, to, to come through. So not everybody on this call may see those red fields. And again, if you go look on task, you should see them there. When you go to um, you go to report or uh, you go to report, choose the columns, you should see those red fields. If you don't, it's a system property. You can just search for it about uh, displaying extended fields. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move forward to make sure that we're able to get through all of the content. So real quickly, let's just talk about some best practice when it comes to related list conditions. So keep conditions simple, right? We talked about that. So whenever possible, use straightforward conditions that are easy to understand. Uh, complex conditions can be challenging to maintain and troubleshoot. So make sure that you're using those. Test it thoroughly. Make sure that uh, before deploying the related list conditions in productions that it's been tested in development and or in your testing environment. Make sure that um, or ensure that the conditions filter the data as expected and uh, do not unintentionally restrict information. Uh, involve stakeholders. So anytime that you need to do something that uh, is going to be used uh, or going to be using a related list condition, maybe talk to your stakeholders. Make sure exactly uh, it is what you're doing for them is exactly what they're asking for. Document the conditions if you can. That way that you'll know uh, going forward if uh, a report or something else has a related list condition that uh, someone else will be aware aware of it in some sort of documentation and regularly review and refine. So maybe it changes. So you definitely want to make sure that you check back and and that's really with um, a lot more than just related list conditions. So, you know, going back and checking and reviewing and all this stuff definitely doesn't hurt. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is remote tables. And uh, this one we could probably send, spend an entire session on because uh, there's just so many different things that you can actually do uh, with remote tables and um, the different things that are touching those and, and able to create and things like that. It's very, very interesting. Um, and even as I was putting all of this content together and the things that I did really enlightened me, not something that I've spent uh, an extended amount of time doing, but it definitely did enlighten me. And um, I think that I am going to put a session in, uh, on the calendar in the future where we can have a session that's solely directed towards remote tables and their capability and things like that. But real quick, let's talk about uh, some things. So how do they work? Right. So remote, remote tables fetch data from ex external sources or another instance using REST or SOAP. Uh, the data does remain read only and transient in the platform memory. Um, and without importing or sorting, you can view and handle the external data as you would internal data. And moreover, you can manage this data using the now platform standard tools like Glide Records, Business Rules, APIs, scripts, table references, and, and some other services as well. So one of the things that, um, and you you might want to make sure that it's the, the remote tables plugin uh, has been activated. So if, if you don't see any of the fields that we look at here in a minute or that uh, when we are in the filter navigator, then you want to make sure that you get with your admin to, do, uh, admin to make sure that that is there. Um, it may come, I don't know if it comes default now or not, but uh, just it's always a good idea to check that out uh, as well. So um what I'm going to do uh, in our example here is I, I went out and got a weather API, a free weather API, and I grabbed that link. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to put that inside of a uh, script that would then populate a remote table uh, whenever it's ran. And actually, I'll, I'll put the same information into a report. So this is a screenshot of the actual website that I got it from. It's not all there, but um, I put in where I am from and then it generated um, some the latitude, longitude and then the hourly temperature. And it's the past uh, um, seven days and the previous uh, or the forward seven days that I grabbed. And uh, very, very um, awesome when I was able to actually make this happen. So the first thing I need to do is I actually need to create a table. So here, uh, it's not a big table, but I'm going to create a, a remote table that's just going to house the two sets of information that I have pulling in. And this, I'm just going to name, I'm going to give it a, a label, and I just called it weather. And then it will automatically uh, generate a name. And when I click on that, you'll see that it is UST. So that lets you know that it is a um, custom table that has been created. And then I'm going to save that. And I don't I didn't need the mobile module. That's why I unchecked that. Um, and you can let me stop this for a minute. So right over let me back it up. So you can see here. So if you had a module that you had already created, 
let's say an application that you created and it was showing up in the filter navigator and you wanted this information to show up, you could use this drop down and put that in there and you could give it a new menu name. So you could actually show it in the filter navigator if you chose to. I didn't need to do that for this demo. So that's why I wasn't there, but I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you. So here, all I'm doing is I'm going to create a um, temp time. So that's going to let us know what time the temperature actually is. And that's going to be a date time. And then I'm going to create a temp. And those are the only two that I need to create for this particular example that I'm going to do. Uh, pop that in there. And you'll notice that the sys ID was automatically uh, created. And then once I save that, I want to pause and talk about something. So if you'll notice, a lot of times when you or all the time when you create a table that's not a remote table, you'll get a updated on, sys updated on, sys created on. Those will be automatically created. But this information is just sitting in memory. So there's no, it's it's every time that it's actually ran. So when I add this to the script and then I run the report, that's when it's going out to the API and grabbing that data. And it's just putting it in memory within the platform. So it doesn't need an updated on or created on or all that or any of that information because it's not storing that information, you know, in that table to be used anywhere else. It's it's just using that remote table to store the API information. And then every time that you open up and run that report, that information just gets rewrote on. So there's why well, there's no reason for that information to be there. So let me go. And I added those there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually add that um that same information into a definition. So I got to make a definition for the report table. So here I'm going to name it whatever, and then I'm going to search for that table that I just created. So when I type in weather, there it is. Now I have a script that I've already, that's already been wrote for me, and I'm going to grab that and I'm going to paste that in there. And what you'll see is that same API URL that you saw previously is now inside of that script. And then also the two different um, columns that are inside of my table. So very bare bones. It's going to go out there. It's going to grab that information, like I said, every time that that is called. And then it's going to pull back those different results. And then we'll actually be able to see it. So here I've highlighted to show that it's there. And then also you'll be able to see that the two tables down there are there. Uh, I mean, the two columns within our table are there as well. So this is just defining a script. It's going to write to the remote table from the API whenever it's ran. And then we can actually see that inside of a report. So I'll, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go directly to that actual table. So the UST weather, I'm going to show that. So it's there. Now there are all of my temperatures. And rather than me having to actually go and create a report, which I could do that by going to the report builder, but I'm just going to right click on that header and I'm just going to select a bar chart. And that's going to open up the report designer for me. Now I'm going to change it up a little bit to make sure that it's information that looks good. I'm going to do a spline chart here. And then I'm going to, I don't want it to group by anything. So I'm going to remove that group by. And then I also am going to show it. I want to show it by date. Um, and I think I made a mistake and showed it by day. And then I'm going to average that. And then under style, I just want to see those points, those markers. I like that. So when I run that, uh, it looks kind of, similar to the one that we saw in the screenshot from the actual website, but I need to change this. I need to go back and make that date. Um, so once I do per date and I run that again, so here we can see that it's showing me the previous and then the forward. So there's some forecasting in there. And But all of this information is coming directly from the API. It's not any information that I have to populate or anything like that. The API is doing all of that information uh, for me. So this is just one example of the way that you can use um, remote tables, right? And again, this is just one way of using remote tables. Um, integration Hub is another way that you can use remote tables by creating information inside of the Integration Hub. And like I said, I think the amount of time that I've allotted to remote, remote tables in this particular session is definitely not enough because I can see um, even with just some questions that are coming coming in or things like that, that it's it's one that needs its own session. So I'll definitely make sure that I get that on there. And for um, the sake of time, we have about eight minutes left. And I do want to make sure that I get the database views. But I also do want to make sure that I 
uh, ask Adam if there's anything that he wants to add to this. Uh, and I, I love remote tables. Um, whether we're we're using a data stream from Integration Hub, which a lot of the out of the box folks have to pull data in to just display extra data that's sitting someplace else, we can do it that way. And then I'll also do it to transform data um, to come through that the data doesn't have remote tables that don't actually have to have to have to have remote data. Um, so I'll do them. I, I've done them in the past where I would run a glide aggregate and flatten data where we wanted to uh, show a report that had the the number of open incidents or, or or the number of groups that had more than five open incidents, something to that effect, which gets a little weird. Um, but I can do it by using creating a remote table, which does the first level of aggregate or whatever I need to do, or whatever transformation, and then come back uh, and come back through with it. Um, so remote table is incredibly useful for read data to transform it to the way I want to see it. Um, and if you go, the best thing I can say to do for remote tables before Thomas yanks me off to talk about database views is go look at what's out of the box. There's some really interesting things that are in there um, that make it really simple, really easy. And what we do is remove the complexity from the end user having to know how to report on it, put that into a script so that it's just a table that has the answers I'm looking for really quickly, really easily, really efficiently. And, and I, I can, I can take that burden of the complexity away from my user and put it on my shoulders and make sure it's right. Just a really, really incredible, incredibly powerful tool for you. Awesome. Thank you. I don't know, five minutes database views may be kind of tough. We'll see what we can do here. Um, so real quick, just some best practice. So, you know, regularly validate the data source connections. Make sure that what you're connecting to is what it should be and that hasn't changed. Optimize the data retrieval. So uh, limit the amount of data that you're actually pulling back. Make sure that you're checking that regularly. Maintain data security and compliance. So be mindful of the data privacy regulations and security best practice on what you're actually pulling in. Data may be sensitive. So certain eyes, obviously, can they be on that? Implement error handling mechanisms. So if something goes wrong with the, the pull into the remote table uh, from the API or whatever you choose to do, make sure that you are, you know, have a way of actually seeing those errors and handling those. And then, of course, like I said before in previous ones, document, review, and re document and review configuration. So if you have that out there, if you create a remote table that has a script that's pulling information back from somewhere, make sure that it's documented how that's done so it can be passed off to somebody else later if it needs to be. So let's see. Not on the right screen. So um, four minutes database views may be tough. Let me see if I can do it. So uh, database views in ServiceNow uh, in the platform is a logical virtual representation of data. Um, database views are very, very powerful. And there's definitely uh, situations that they're needed inside of the platform. Um, and, you know, we can't list out all of those different scenarios here in this time that we have, but it is something that is there and that is available. You um, Some benefits of doing those things, uh, consolidated data access. So data view, database views allow you to seamlessly combine data from multiple tables, uh, enhance report accuracy. So consolidating related data from diverse sources into coherent view, users can create more comprehensive and accurate reports. Efficient data, manage, data management, database views are read-only, which ensures that the underlying data remains the same. It can't be changed. This provides a later pr uh, protection uh, against unintentional data modification. Flexibility in data representation. Users can tailor database views according to their specific uh, reporting needs. They can select relevant columns from different tables and define custom filters to sort that information and improve performance. So for reports that regularly pull data from multiple tables, Maybe using a database view can optimize that performance. Uh, instead of repeatedly joining tables on the fly, database view provides a pre-joined pre efficient access point for uh, the data. So it does require an admin to actually create those. So um, anyone can use a database view in a report. Uh, you don't need to worry about uh, or need to create ACLs on the fields that are inside of a database view. But also, if you want to require explicit read ACLs to be added, there is a Glide uh, record that you can actually change to do that. Um, and again, if there's any ACLs that are on underlying data that are in that, those will stay true um, as well. So there are a lot of out-of-the-box database views that come with the platform. Uh, if you're not aware of those, just simply go to database views. You might or may not be able to actually see those, but you can def definitely ask someone 
that has the access to do that. But taking this list here, you can definitely, uh, and this comes from the docs, you can call those in a report or a PA or wherever you need to do that. Um, so example use cases. So a couple of those, uh, if you need to use the IT department wants a report showcasing each employee, their device assigned to them and their access levels. A view can consolidate data from the user table, asset management table, and user roles table, making it straightforward to generate such a report. Again, you, I'll show these inside of the PDF, just some different ways for you to um, think about that. So the demo, I'm going to go ahead and do the demo. If you need to drop off for the sake of time, I, I definitely apologize we got to the top of the hour so quickly, but I do want to make sure that we uh, do show some demos here. But if you need to drop, I understand, again, the recording will be out there later on today or tomorrow, and all of this information will be there as well. So with that, let's... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add it to it as we bring this up. With database views, um, super powerful, really useful. But don't use them if you don't need them. I, I do right. see people go to database views right right away. Uh, for those of us who have a SQL background, you're like, oh, I do everything in views. They're a tool that we need sometimes, but dot walking negates the the normal use case for views. Lots of times it's going to do those joins for us. So make sure that dot walking doesn't work for you. And then even if I have an M to M, I don't need a database view because I just report on the dot on the M to M table and dot walk up both sides. I need a database view. There's two use cases that I need a database view. One, I'm joining to a doc ID, which is what we see in um, metrics, in SLAs, and Spotlight. It's a doc ID. It's not a real reference. So I need to use a, a database view for that. And if I'm doing two M to Ms, an M to M to M, if I have two M to M tables, I will need a database view. Those two, you need them. Um, the example Thomas has here, we have the doc IDs from metrics or from assessments. Um, then you need them. But don't use them if you don't need them. Don't over database view yourself. It's just extra maintenance that no that for no for no benefit. Awesome, I totally agree with that, Adam. Definitely. Uh, one of the the demos that I I sort of go to a lot is because I've heard it a lot in the community from questions is survey data, and um, I actually did a session on the same demo, a, an an hour long session on the same demo uh, that I can definitely reference in this uh, community event as well. If you want to go back and look at that, so that in case this becomes kind of quick for you because of, like I said, for the lack of time. But one of the, I, I created a database view. And basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to normalize survey data. So when you look at survey data in the table, it is in um, rows with each question being its own row and things of that nature. And a lot of times that can be that can be tough to sort of uh, take in and consume rather than having a user uh, on a row and then those actual column headers be the different questions. So what I did in this is I gave the ability to actually look at that survey data normalized. So in this survey, we have quite a few um, different joints here or different um, things that we're going to do. So the first one is basically I'm just connecting to the assessment instance. And that's simple. I mean, there it is. It, I go to the assessment instance table and I grab that. And then the next thing I do is I'm going to grab, I need the questions, each one of the questions. And here, I you have to use sys IDs. Now, where I actually got these sys IDs from is you can go to, um, let me look at my notes here. If you go to, how did that change? Sorry about that. I'm going to go to this specific table. So, SES, MT, underscore, assessment, I'm sorry, metric. And I'll do this with just one of them, so we're going to have to do it. So this table, and here I'm going to look for service desk. So this is the particular survey that we're using inside of this particular demo. So when I go inside of that, here we can see, let's go in there. Let it finish here. So if I copy the sys ID for this particular one, this is the actual survey that we're looking at in that particular um, uh, database view that we created. So when I copy that sys ID, then that gives me the ability to go back into, let me go back to my history, get there faster. So again, the question, 
This is the actual survey that it's coming from, which is the sys ID that I grabbed. The next thing I need to do is get the actual question, right? So the way where I can go and actually get the question is for this particular case. And again, you can go back and watch the full one on this. Um, ASMT underscore assessment. If I can type. So this table houses all the different questions out there, right? And here we can see the service desk status. So this is particular survey. So I know that these questions are related to that, right? And if I group by metric, then I'll actually be able to get those particular questions for each one of those. Come on, be nice. I'm an instance. This is why. I There we go. Okay. So here in the category, I'm going to search for service desk. Okay. There we go. So these particular, these are the questions that are related to that particular survey. So if I go into any one of these, right, and I go into that particular question and I right click and I grab that once it finishes loading here. There we go. I can copy that sys ID. And again, I can do that for all of the different questions, right? And I come in here and I paste that here. That actually gives me that particular question, okay? So I do that for every one of the questions. There may be three questions. There may be 10 questions, whatever it may be. And I grab that and I, I pull those two together. And when I try it and I run this, you'll see here that here's the status act, the survey. It lets me know the number. It lets me know the assigned two users. And now those questions are above the top. Well, you'll notice that I have one of those that actually gives me the actual question. Because if you don't, then they just come back as string values. So the other thing that I did in this particular case is I went to the SIS dictionary. And I was actually able to create or change the um what they're actually gonna the value of those particular ones so now it's some relevance right because stay there because what happens is is that just saying string value or whatnot there's no there's no true value in that i mean how, how are you supposed to know which question that any one of these scores actually relate to right so what you can do is you can add you can go to the sys dictionary assist documentation yeah. Right. You're adding a label, a label for the, yeah. uh, for the database view. This is documentation. I was answering a question on that moment ago. Uh, I believe the the label, the module is label, but sys underscore do, uh, documentation is the table. That's right. I went straight to the. It's it's a related list in a lot of places. And I actually don't know if there is a module. Um, but now we'll put in the the table will be the database, the database view name. Um, yeah. And then we can um, uh, add all. There we go. Yeah, yeah. So here, so again, sorry about that. Uh, so the sys underscore documentation um, dot list is the, the table that I went to. And basically what you do is you're going to uh, create a different label for the different strings that are in there. So basically I went in there and I said, okay, I want to norm. I gave, that's the demo. That's the um, the database view that I had. The, this is the label that I want to do. And then the element, I choose whichever question, the string value that's in those results that corresponds to that. And then there's a hint that you can also do. That's basically when you hover over the question, that's the hint that it'll give. And you can do that for every one of the particular questions that you have inside of your database view. And now it's actual relevant to someone that's actually looking at it. So again, understanding that when we go back to this and we try it again, um, that's how we're actually able to get a label. And again, you notice when I hover over it, there's that same hint. So by going and changing a label or creating a label in the six dic six dictionary that corresponds to this this other to this database view, a column in that, you can take that and you and you can do that for for anything. So if anything, if you have a uh, a database view that returns some sort of string value based on what you're doing, you can definitely change those headers to make it be um something else. 
So again, there's an hour long that we did on building this out that is going to be much better for you than the five or eight or nine minutes that I've rushed through doing it. And it shows, and there's also a blog as well that's out um, that I'll put into this as well that actually shows you step-by-step on how to change these column headers um, as well. So I apologize. I got a little confused there. All right. So did any questions come in? I know we're way over here, but I can't see questions at the moment. Do we have anything we need to look at? Also One about um, about what's going on. I set the where a uh, specific uh, joining question where I only want to see the active changes. Um, if you have a if a database view is not working the way that you're expecting, if you can, I would post it into the um, into the community with a screenshot of your where clauses. It's it's hard to diagnose exactly what's on there. I'm seeing what's on there. But if you take a screenshot of uh, the database view and the, the tables and the where clauses, normally somebody can point out um, what's going on uh, to come through. But I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer that right now. Okay. So real quick, let me just kind of go over some best practices and I'll get everybody out of here because uh, I think that th these are definitely things to think about when doing uh, database views. So de define the, the purpose clearly. Before creating a view, ensure that you know exactly what you need to create and understand the business uh, need as, and what it's going to address. So again, like Adam said a few moments ago, just don't create them to create them. They're, that's not their value. Make sure that you understand and have a clear purpose and reason of why you actually need to create it. Maybe even that being the last source of uh, the way that you need to bring information together. Uh, limit the number of tables. So again, like anything else, the more that you add to it, the more um, possibility of it having some latency and things of that nature. So make sure that you're looking at the, the number of tables that you actually add to it. And as usual with everything else, optimize it and test it. Make sure that you built it the best way that's going to run it the uh, most judiciously and get it back to that information back to the user as, as quick as possible. And like I said, with everything else, document it. Know the way that you have those joins. Know which tables are joining to what. If you, and especially if you're using, like in my example, SysIDs, document that information. That way, if a question is added or a question is changed in the survey example, you want to make sure that you have those SysIDs uh, correct and always ensure data integrity and security. So database views should, should respect uh, data access controls just because data from multiple tables is combined into a view doesn't mean that all users should still see it. So make sure that you keep that information um, in mind. So definitely some best practices around that. Obviously, we've been answering questions. The only thing that I, if we didn't get to your question, or if you have more database view questions, please ask those in the community. Feel free to tag me. I'll make sure that we get you an answer to that as best we possibly can. And I, like I said, I'll definitely um, put the link to the, the course that we did or the session that we did um, uh, last year, a couple of years ago that talks about this. And if we need to get a database views, a session on the calendar. We'll definitely do that as well. It looks like somebody asked for that. Uh, the one thing that I want to say, these are all slides that you've seen before uh, or in, was also in the video, but in two weeks, our own Adam Stout, who's answered most of the questions on this call, is going to uh, give us our first sort of uh, look into leveraging Gen AI for analytics, Code Assist. You'll want to be at this one. Make sure that you put it on your calendar in two weeks to be at this one, I anticipate it being uh, very good. All of his sessions definitely are. I apologize for going over 15 minutes. I appreciate all the panelists and we'll see everybody in two weeks.